This place doesn't look like much, does it? I didn't believe this was Randall's old joint until I checked inside. Shame that it's been left abandoned. That painting is something to see. Going alpha right out the gate, huh? Good negotiating tactic. Your body language needs work, though. Puff your chest out. It looks... meaner. At any rate, you're here in all your glory. The Courier. Do you get tired of that title? It's not very... imposing, you know? Maybe that's the beauty of it. Nobody expects to be down by a messenger. Hey, here's your letter. Oh, and you're dead. Do you pronounce it Courier or Courier? Probably doesn't matter. Tomato, tomato. It's a matter of what I need, actually. My job is to relay a message from my supervisor, a fellow by the name of Marco. See, he's rather upset over his brother's death, and he wants to settle with you, in Utah. It's a very long trip. Luckily, I know the way. You are tightly wound, you know that? Just relax, hero. You'll get there soon enough. First, you're gonna help me with some business here. There are a few contacts here in the Mojave that I need to sort out on behalf of Marco's business interests. Funny thing is that there's some overlap with your past work. I managed to look through some of Randall's old records in the shack. To his credit, the man kept very meticulous records. He must have been quite the typist. Anyway, if you want to reach Utah, First you'll help me solve problems. Sort of like bounty hunting. Oh, and don't worry, you won't have to kill any women or children. Nothing that might compromise your code. These pretty much have it coming. Traveling to Frostal isn't like taking one of your little nature walks here in the valley. It's hundreds of miles through dangerous terrain. On top of that, you could easily encounter roaming bands of cannibalistic tribals, or just get lost and freeze to death in the mountains. But I'm sure you pondered all that when you made that crack about killing me. What a team we'll be. I can't wait! Gotta make a little stop before we meet the first guy. Here's the spot on your map. See you there.
Ah, you made it. The fiends really know how to make a neighborhood their own, don't they? Speaking of fiends, you remember Eileen, right? Slightly unbalanced gal who liked to sever men's genitalia? Yeah, hard to forget. Way back when you knocked her off, NCR started telling people that it was finally safe to start moving in around here, due to law and order. Well, as you probably know, the fiends were a bit more resilient than they had expected. Oh, and it turns out Eileen wasn't even the worst one. Actually, she kept some of the more savage elements in line with the threat of emasculation. What a word, emasculation. Shout it to the heavens. After you disposed of Eileen, a nice gentleman named Troy took over her crew. He was no power player, but he certainly left his mark. You see, Troy was a chronic rapist, even worse than old Cook Cook. Not long after the Owen family moved in here, Troy paid him a visit. Let's go inside and see his handiwork, shall we? You know, if I knew that I caused this, even in a crazy, roundabout sort of way, that would just eat me up inside. Sort of awkward now. That's the spirit. Denial. I love it. As a kid, my dad, a raging, wild drunk, would regularly beat us, then refuse to acknowledge it. Later I found out that smashing someone's kneecaps with a bat tends to correct the problem. They also confess a lot. A kneecap revival, if you will. Relax, we're not going down that road. When you're 13, you do all sorts of things that make you cringe later on. Hormones, I suppose. Point is, old Pappy stayed in denial until it blew up in his face. Or his kneecaps. You can lie to yourself, but the truth will have its day. On that note, let's go deliver some truth to Troy. You can even use the bat technique if you want. See you there. I just love a quick jaunt through the ruins of a dead city. Makes me feel privileged to be alive. Maybe that's just me. I suppose we should make our way to Troy now, seeing as to how you're a famous, cold-blooded, God-fearing bounty hunter. I'll follow your lead. One thing, though. Please don't cut off random fingers in the hopes of collecting a reward. After you. What is it? It was given to me when I came of age, so very long ago. Though it's unsightly and cumbersome, there's no questioning its value. The targeting alone has saved my skin more than a few times. Of all the paths I've walked, all the trials I've endured, it's been constant. Yes, this pit boy is better than a loyal hound. Certainly superior to a wife. God, it's not even close. Do you find that remarkable? Most people have rather strong assumptions about vault dwellers. We're all naive, agoraphobic shut-ins, right? Some of them never adapt to the outside, but me. I never liked being... trapped. As a boy, I constantly dreamed of life beyond the vault. I escaped through literature and comic books. Never cared for school itself. My father... punished me. He even destroyed my books. I didn't care. I could paint grand vistas in my mind, climbing to the highest peaks while taking in real sunlight, breathing unfiltered air. My father hated his lot in the vault, working maintenance. He hated even more that I was content to spend my time withdrawn from his world. He drank a lot, beat me and my brother when things boiled over. Overseer was a real traditional type, didn't want to interfere, so nothing changed. Dad had plans for me. Maintenance and repair in the vault. An auspicious occupation. 
I probably would have killed myself if I'd stayed in that vault. When I was 13, the water chip gave out, so we had to make contact with the outside. I wanted to leave with a scouting expedition. Dad said no. I planned on sneaking out with my kid brother. Couldn't leave him with Dad. I got caught, and the old man pummeled me unconscious. I ended up in the infirmary. Dad wound up in his cell. Didn't last, though. Overseer released him the next day. He had critical skills. You see, I found that life is a series of epiphanies. Some are minute, others hit you like a freight train. I had a big one in the infirmary. I realized that the rules would always work against me in my dreams. Somebody with money or power pulls the strings, snuffs them out. It was that realization that finally pushed me over the edge. Or made my balls drop. One night I picked up Dad's bat and bashed his kneecaps. He cried like a little girl, apologized and confessed till he was hoarse. My stepmom stayed out of it. She was a timid soul. I told them that me and my brother were leaving, and that they shouldn't bother trying to find us. Dad just sobbed and nodded. There was a skeleton crew guarding the entrance, so we slipped out before they found Dad. Don't know what became of him. Knowing what I know now, I only wish that finished that bastard off. He was a waste of life. We left at night, but it was still disconcerting at first seeing the sky above you, like an ocean bearing down on you. You feel so small. We adjusted soon enough, just kept walking east. It was so stupid in hindsight. A couple of kids with a baseball bat, nothing more. You see, back east there aren't all these nations like you have here. It's just towns and tribes with no real order. We had no idea. I wish I could tell you we found a town and everything worked out. Not the case. We were picked up by slavers led by a man named Dickie. Dickie ran a roaming band who would lease out slaves to towns or raiding crews. To his credit, he was a sharp trader. I thought I had taken some harsh beatings, but the slavers made Dad seem like some grandma with an old switch. They were merciless. It only bothered me when they hit my brother, though. He was no more than eight at the time, so they planned on making him a sex slave. I despised Dickie not because of his cruelty, but because he was always smiling, whistling, making cracks. Dad may have been an abusive cretin, but at least he imparted some mechanical know-how. That's how I got the slave collars off. We ran until our blood burned and our bare feet bled, then ran some more. Dickie was tracking us with dogs, was closed when I spotted the town. In that moment I knew we wouldn't make it. Dickie and his crew were too fast, so I sent my brother off towards the town while I backtracked. He made it, I didn't. If I'd known what awaited me, the sheer hell of it, I might have killed myself before they took me. Do you always imagine elaborate, contrived showdowns with your antagonists? I'm afraid Marco's a touch more pragmatic in his outlook. Don't worry, he'll fight you on his own terms when the time's right. First, I have to see to his interests while he stabilizes things in Utah. He told me that Sergio came here, squared off with you in some mountain town. Didn't work out well for him, did it? Do you want Marco that badly? You have to know that it's risky going up to Utah. Oh, you escaped the icy clutches of death, so now you don't fear anything, huh? That's a tired cliché. Getting popped by some thug dressed like a chessboard is one thing. Facing off with Marco is something else. Who the fuck are you? What the fuck are you doing here? Troy, Troy, Troy. You have been a busy little boy, haven't you? All that robbing and raping going on, yet you can't seem to return messages. What? Who the fuck? I'm about to light your ass up, cocksucker. You know who I am. I'm gonna smoke you, then fuck you right up the ass. No, you won't, Troy. Do you know who I work for? A gentleman by the name of Marco. He's very unhappy that you ignored his messages. Not good, Troy. Marco? He sent you? Oh, 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 fuck. I, I didn't mean to ignore it. What are you doing? This is how you're doing it! Nope. Dignity intact. You could have avoided that.
this with timely correspondence. Next time, could you please wait until I finish my speech? Marco likes it when we scare them first. Reputation, you know? Regardless, he's dead, so good work. What do the bounty people normally say when you bring them rotting fingers? Actually, I don't want to know. Next stop, Freeside. We get to take in the splendor of Vegas' Grand Cesspool. I'll see you there. Hey, you're the one who's been going around helping people around here, right? What do you need? Uh, urine, feces, vomit. That's the intoxicating aroma of Freeside. It's like smelling hopelessness. If you're wondering, this fine establishment is known as Carl's Candy, with a K. Unfortunately, they do not offer confectionaries. No, Carl's is just one of many brothels in Freeside, but it should interest you for at least one reason. <laughs> no, not that one. That comely young lady soliciting her services on the corner is known as Jill. Apparently, she's the daughter of the late Charlie Halfcock. See, Charlie's mercenary work provided for his daughter after his wife left him. With a name like Halfcock, you can imagine why she left. Single father with half a penis and a powerful rifle. What a story. But then, he met you. His kid? Orphaned. Though only at the tender age of 16, Jill took it upon herself to make her way in the Mojave. With few marketable skills, Jill was soon forced to rely on her most valuable asset, her body. Carl quickly scooped her up and made her his own. But it doesn't end there, friend. Carl doesn't just pimp out girls. He makes them utterly dependent through chem abuse. Pretty soon, Jill was strung out on jet and completely broke. She became de facto property of Carl. Coincidentally, I have to deliver some news to Carl so we can kill two perverts with one stone. You better lead the way, though. My rugged looks are simply magnetic to females, and I don't want to be swarmed by hussies. Fuck up, bitch! Uh, do you mind? I am trying to work here. If you're looking for some tail... I'm Shut here. the fuck up, bitch! You want another smack? Do you? When Carl says to suck his dick, you better motherfucking suck! Uh, do you mind? I am trying to work here. If you're looking for some tail, Check downstairs. Ah, Carl. Tell me, does it make you feel strong when you smack around starving hookers? This is a real man right here. Ooh, excuse me? You gonna walk into my place and lay down attitude? Motherfucker, I will crack your skull open and shit in it. As much as I want to be moved by that arresting imagery, I need to get to the point. 
Do you remember the arrangement you had with Marco? Marco? Are you serious? That motherfucker ain't even real. So I took some guy's money and said I'd kick it out to Marco. What of it? It was a scam. No scam, Carl. You knowingly stole from one of Marco's associates, then went on to denounce the whole affair in public. Bad judgment, my boy. <laughs> you, you can't be serious. I was just joking with some boys in free... Everyone knows Marco isn't real. Right? Oh, oh, fuck, man. Oh, fuck. Holy shit, man. No Help! joke, Carl. We'll make it quick. Or maybe not. It's really up to the discretion of my associate. What do you need? Hey. And that's how it's done, partner. You showed patience, but didn't hesitate when it was time to act. Well done. Just one more stop and then we can begin the great trek. There's a little homestead I want you to see first, though. Here's the spot on your map. What do you need? Mm. This fine residence is the home of Dana Quigley, widow of the late Tom Quigley. You remember him, right? Though an inveterate womanizer and a madman, Ranger Quigley still sent proceeds from his caravan robberies to his family. When his mischief caught up with him, Mrs. Quigley found herself destitute and struggled to provide for three children. On the verge of starvation and homelessness, Mrs. Quigley soon received an offer from a businessman. In exchange for a hefty sum, he would seize Mrs. Quigley's daughter and sell her to Kaiser's Legion. She accepted the offer. While the initial windfall tided them over for a spell, the Quigley residence has fallen in hard times once again. Crop failures and whatnot. Already maddened with regret over her daughter's fate, now Mrs. Quigley must decide how to proceed. Sell the farm? Prostitute herself? Sell a child? The Dilemmas of the Wasteland. Why don't we pay her a visit? You should have plenty to talk about.
Can I help you? Unless you got a golden goose, there's nothing. Damn fat cats in town are about to push me off my land. I, I don't know what to say. Wait, did the hostlers put you up to this? You don't look rich. How did you get that kind of cash? Is this a con? Well, okay. This is... I, I don't know what to say to this other than thank you. You're going to give us our lives back, stranger. God bless you. Hello. Did it burn you up having to lie to her like that? Maybe it was natural for you. You can tell yourself that she's got the cap, so it makes things right. But deep down, that demon whispers the truth. You caused this. Try to bury it, suppress it all you want. Everything you've done comes back to you in the end. If all my pestering is starting to bother you, take heart. We're nearing the end of the line. We've got a date with some fancy legionary near Cottonwood Cove. See you there. Yes? This nice little cavern is the temporary home of one Marcus Scribonius Libodrusus, an important man given his responsibility, slaves. Unbeknownst to his comrades, Drusus has been engaged with unsavory elements that happen to be in the employ of Marco. Lining your pockets is a capital offense in Kaiser's Legion, along with everything else. But corruption makes it more capital? Recently, Drusus has had second thoughts about his past exchanges. So it's high time he's reminded of his obligations. Who dares intrude in my quarters? Name yourselves. Not a polite reception, I must say. Is the hammer necessary? <laughs> I think you're making my friend nervous. Requies caught in pake, Drusus. He couldn't accept the change rendered by his choices. Now, where have I heard that before? If you're poised to lose some witty retort or just good old-fashioned vitriol, save it for just a touch longer. My business here is settled, so I must depart for Frosto. If you wish to join me, go to the Northern Passage and we'll make found preparations. Oh, and please leave any accompanying rabble here in the Mojave. Marco instructed me to bring you and no one else. See you there.
Have you seen that tower?